Jesus Christ was going to come into the world. His birth was foretold by the angel to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And then in John chapter 1 and verse 1, John points out that the Word, the second member of the Godhead, was God also, just as the Father, just as the Holy Spirit. And so he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then in verse 14, we read that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. After 400 years of silence from the heavens, God came to earth in the flesh in Jesus Christ. But his physical life had a specific purpose. And that is that he would pay the debt for sin for all time. In the words of the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 2 in verse 9, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And since, as the prophet said, the soul that sins, it shall die, Ezekiel 18 and 20, Jesus paid the price for me and for you. He paid the penalty for every human being, both this side of the cross and on the other side of the cross, in the patriarchal and the mosaic dispensations. But Jesus was going to have to leave the earth and ascend back to the Father. But his work was going to have to continue. He would not be able to be here in the flesh to help his apostles and to, to physically guide them. So he promised that a helper would come, a comforter, as he called him. In John chapter 14 and John chapter 16, he said, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. He will teach you all things. He will bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. So he promised that the Holy Spirit would come. And then, in the first chapter of the book of Acts, Jesus is there with his apostles and he begins, to, he says some parting words to them that's recorded in Luke 24, verses 46 through 49. And then he begins to ascend up into heaven. He is taken up from the apostles in a cloud. The angels, two angels are standing by. They begin to speak to the apostles. Why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Now, ten days later, the day comes. The first Pentecost following the Lord's resurrection. The day which took place fifty days after the Passover feast. And as you open up the second chapter of the book of Acts, the apostles are doing exactly as Jesus had commanded them. In Luke chapter 24, he told them to tarry in the city of Jerusalem until they be endued with power from on high. And so there they were. They were waiting. Luke the inspired historian records what happens on that day. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house wherein they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
the comforter, the helper, comes to them just as Jesus had promised them that he would. One of the amazing things is that when you go through, when you go through Scripture, God specifies a time and a place in which he wants certain things to be accomplished. And even where the entrance of Jesus into the world is concerned, John Paul writes in Galatians 4 and verse 4, When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son when the time was right. Not with us, but with God. He chose the time. And the same thing is true where Pentecost Day was concerned. He chose the right day and the right time because thousands upon thousands of Jews had come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. Jerusalem was filled with people, with Jews on that day. Thousands of Jews were gathered together as this sound, this violent sound of a wind comes from heaven and as the Holy Spirit comes. And when all of this begins to take place, there's confusion on the part of many of the people who were gathered together. What does this mean? What meaneth this? And then they began to try and look for some kind of a way to try and explain what's taking place from their point of view. Well, these men must be drunk. They must be full of new wine. And as a matter of fact, they also ask, are not all these that speak Galileans? And by the way, that question was no compliment at all. Because if you were a Galilean, you were considered to be unlearned. Ignorant as far as this world standard is concerned. You remember Peter and John in Acts chapter 4? as they heal the lame man. And the religious leaders are standing by and they're noticing Peter and John. They saw what has just taken place. And Luke says, when they perceived that these were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. While they're uneducated, they're just simple Galileans. That's what many of these people were thinking that day. Are not all these that speak Galileans, well, then we notice again the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and what their thoughts were concerning this and what Peter says about that. So the people ask the question then, are not all these that speak Galileans? Well, they must be drunk. They must be full of new wine. And then Peter stands up with the other apostles. He lifts up his voice and then he begins to explain. He explains it now from heaven's point of view, not theirs. So he says to them then, he says, these are not drunk. We are not drunk as you suppose, seeing it as the third hour of the day. And then he gives the inspired explanation. What you're seeing taking place now is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And so this is what he does. He quotes from one of the people's own prophets. Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. So he quotes from that, and the people are familiar with that. They're also familiar with the term last days because the Messiah had long been anticipated by the Jewish people. Yes, they had a misconception of what the Messiah would do and the kind of kingdom that he was going to establish. But they did, in fact, look for the Messiah. And so he quotes from Joel in, in verse 17, and then 18, and then 19. And so he shows these people that what you're seeing taking place today is the work of God. It's the work of God. 
And he says in verse 21, It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, he's got their ear at this point. So they're listening to him. We know that at least 3,000 people are listening with willing minds. He has their attention. And now he preaches a sermon about the Messiah. And you can certainly expect that that would be his subject content for that day, and that time. And he was going to say some things to them that they needed to hear. And so the first thing that he does, and you've got the main body of Peter's sermon in verses 22 through 36, but the first thing that he does is let the people know that Jesus was sent by God. And so he says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. Many of these people had witnessed the miracles that Jesus had performed, such as turning the water into wine, such as healing the sick, casting demons out of individuals, causing the dumb to speak, the blind to see. Many of them had witnessed these same things. And so he says then, he continues, and he says, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So it was not just a coincidence of history that Jesus was taken and crucified. It was actually according to the plan of God. But you are the ones who nailed him to the cross. You are the ones who are guilty of his crucifixion. Sometimes where gospel preaching is concerned, there are those who say, well, I don't want to hear any negative preaching. I want to hear something positive. Well, when we faithfully preach the gospel... There has to be a combination of both. There has to be a negative aspect, and there has to be a positive aspect. Concerning the negative, it may have to do with what a group of people has done, sin that has been committed. That's negative. Sometimes people say, well, I don't want to be made to feel guilty. Let me tell you something. On this day, on this occasion... That's what those people needed to feel. They needed to feel guilt. They needed to understand what they were guilty of. Jesus was taken and by wicked hands, he's been crucified and slain. He's been crucified. He's been killed. You're the ones who are guilty of it. And you know, the thing is, Every individual, not just those Jews on Pentecost, but every individual is just as guilty of the crucifixion of Christ. And someone may argue, well, I didn't drive the nails into his flesh. I didn't call out for his crucifixion. I didn't throw the spear into his side. But it was sin that caused Jesus' death upon the cross that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Well, the wages of sin is death. Romans 6 and verse 23. That means, inasmuch as I'm guilty of sin and have been guilty of sin, just as every other accountable human being, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23 that makes me just as guilty as they were. Now, that's the negative aspect. But there's a positive aspect. And this is what they also needed to hear. In verse 32, Peter says, This 
Jesus, the one that you've nailed to the cross. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. And he goes on to point out, not only has God raised him from the dead, but he has ascended into heaven. He's been exalted by God's right hand. So Peter preaches then, not just the crucifixion, but the exaltation of Christ. So yes, that's what they needed to hear. And then Peter continues, and now he drives home the point. Therefore, in view of everything that he said so far, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. That's every one of you who are listening to my voice. This whole assembly of thousands of people, let all of you know that God has made both Lord and Christ this Jesus whom you've crucified. Now I want to tell you something. At that point, for 3,000 people, that did it for them. That convicted them. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They were convicted. And they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? We've been guilty of the crucifixion of the Son of God. What can we do about it? And now Peter goes on to tell them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You know, sometimes, sometimes we call this the invitation, which is extended. And we do that with every gospel sermon. We offer an invitation. And you see, there's something about an invitation that is true today and was true then. The Lord's invitation calls for a personal commitment. It calls for personal conviction. It calls for a challenge. And so Peter says, this is what you need to do. And now, it calls for a personal choice. No one can do it for me. No one can obey the Lord for me. I have to do it myself. And then we read in verse 41, They that gladly received His word were baptized, and there were added unto them that day about 3,000 souls. Now I want to tell you something. This was a day to remember. It was a day that Jews would be telling their children about for years to come. They would be telling their grandchildren, their great, their great grandchildren, about the day that the church was established. The day that forgiveness was offered by God. 3,000. The day we accepted those terms for pardon. So, there may be someone here and in every assembly where the gospel is preached who needs to have that same conviction, that same personal conviction. People who need to make that same personal commitment. People who need to make that same personal choice to obey the Lord or to walk away, as many did that day. So if your need then is to obey, as 3,000 did on that day to remember, and we encourage you to do that, the same invitation is offered. Repent and be baptized in the name of Christ for the remission of sins. And if you're an unfaithful child of God, your need, your greatest need today is to be restored.
And you have the second law of pardon offered for that. It was stated to Simon in Acts 8, Repent and pray, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. Acts 8 and verse 22. So if you're subject to heaven's invitation,